Hello everybody. I wanted to do this recording uh, for quite some time um, about the effects of black coffee in terms of how much it actually promotes fat burning. Uh, here are my disclosures. I belong to IDM and the fasting method. If you like my video, please give it a thumbs up, share, subscribe. I want to increase the visibility of my channel. Caffeine is something that I really like and it helps me think better and I would like to show how you could use it properly in order to promote your health. What does caffeine do in terms of fat metabolism? Caffeine has a certain property in which through the effect of adrenaline, through our adrenergic system, the epinephrine, it mobilizes fat from fat cells. Not only is the effect through the adrenal hormones, but caffeine has an effect of its own. It's a little too, too geeky to get into what that effect is, but it is independent of the adrenal hormones and it does mobilize fat through activating an enzyme called hormone sensitive lipase. So this is a fat cell, an enzyme is activated that releases fat from the fat cells as fatty acids, that is triglycerides are broken down into glycerol and fatty acids. So the goal today is to find out what happens to the fatty acids that are mobilized by caffeine. Now, in all of my presentation, I will be talking about black coffee. I think that people who are metabolically unhealthy, it is perhaps not right to ingest caffeine with fat because you may mobilize fat from the fat cells as well as taken fat ingested fat and that may potentially prove to be detrimental and prevent weight loss and I will explain that in the presentation. So the fatty acids that are mobilized it can be used as fuel by the muscles. It can be converted in the liver to ketones that our brain likes to use. You would want to avoid this in other words Fatty acids that are taken up by the liver and recycled back to be packed back into the fat cells. You don't want to do that. In case your fat cells are unhealthy, this fat that is recycled by the liver will end up in your liver, in your heart, in your pancreas and cause visceral obesity. Some of the fat that is mobilized is also used to generate heat. This is called thermic energy. So the study that was done was done by Acheson out of Switzerland. There is the reference to the study, eight young men, 23 years of age, normal body mass index, fairly lean, muscle mass was good, fat mass was not significant. In other words, not significantly high. So this is the group of people in which this was studied that I'm giving you the data from. What happened in terms of energy expenditure? So let me take you through this graph. This is 60 minutes before caffeine ingestion. Here, a compound, a drug called beta blockers that block the effect of adrenal hormones in our body was given. At time zero, 500 milligrams of caffeine was given in the caffeine group. In addition to the beta blocker plus caffeine group, which is out here, and then there was a placebo group. With the ingestion of caffeine, there was a significant increase in energy expenditure. As you can see, it went up rapidly. And by four hours, it was fairly significant. When beta blockers were given, the resting energy expenditure actually went down a little bit. And caffeine was able to overcome this. So in other words, the effect of caffeine is perhaps somewhat independent of the adrenal hormones. 
If it was solely as a result of the adrenal hormones, the fight or flight hormone, the epinephrine, the adrenaline, then you should have not seen this increase. However, the increase was not very much. So in other words, taking in beta blockers can perhaps blunt the increase in energy expenditure with caffeine. And this is an important point for medical professionals when they're dealing with somebody at a weight stall, at, at a point in which they're not losing weight, you should consider whether beta blockers are a component in preventing their weight loss. Now in terms of thermic energy, caffeine did increase thermic energy. So let's get that out of the way. What is thermic energy? Now in this slide, I'm showing the level of the mitochondria in the mitochondria, there is a series of chemical reactions that moves hydrogen ions, positively charged hydrogen ions. And these hydrogen ions are made as you are burning fuel, as you're burning fat or carbohydrates or protein. And as you're burning fuel, these hydrogen ions are moved through a certain channel to make the energy currency of the body. The energy currency of the body is ATP. Now what caffeine does is that it activates an uncoupling protein. It makes an uncoupling protein that makes the hydrogen ion bypass this channel. The hydrogen ion move through the uncoupling protein and instead of generating energy currency, they generate heat. And this is well documented in several animal studies in which caffeine has been shown to increase the expression of the uncoupling protein as I have pointed out here. So I don't want to get too geeky, but all I want to explain by this slide is that thermic energy, caffeine does increase heat generation. That's why after drinking caffeine, I just had caffeine I feel a little bit warmer. So let's come back to the fate of the fatty acid that is mobilized. So fatty acid is mobilized with caffeine. What you would like to do is to promote the burning of fat by the muscles, to promote the conversion of fatty acids to ketones so that our brain is happy. You want to reduce this fatty acid recycling that will end up in the visceral fat and we went through thermic energy already. So again to re reiterate this is the process you want to promote. You want to release the fatty acids and you want to channel them through the liver through the mitochondria to convert them to ketones so that you can feed the brain that you want to convert the fatty acids into fuel for the muscles. What you don't want to do is to have this pathway as the predominant pathway that you're using after consumption of caffeine. And in this pathway, the fatty acids are being taken up by the liver. Because you are insulin resistant, these fatty acids are not oxidized in the mitochondria. They cannot enter the mitochondria. They join with glycerol and they get converted into a fat filled cholesterol molecule that Dave Feldman likes to talk about a lot, which is the VLDL, the very low density lipoprotein. This is exported by the liver in search of trying to dump its fat cargo. Now, it is trying to find fat cells to dump the fat cargo back, but if the fat cells are already full, if you are insulin resistant, they refuse to take the fat back. And this fat will then combine with a byproduct of protein metabolism. So fatty acids with serine, in the presence of a certain enzyme, makes a toxic fat product called ceramide. Now ceramide can cause visceral obesity. 
And in here, I chose the pancreas to demonstrate visceral obesity because it can make insulin resistance worse. So in the pancreas are islets that are making insulin and glucagon. And here is a picture of the islets. These light blue are insulin making cells. These dark blue are glucagon making cells. The ceramide ends up in all of the pancreas, but specifically in the alpha cells in which out here I've shown that they are covered with ceramide, they're covered with fat. And these alpha cells and then are no longer able to see insulin and it creates a phenomena of insulin resistance that I have gone into detail in one of my more recent presentations. So ceramide induced lipotoxicity is something that you can potentially increase if you are increasing futile recycling of the fat with caffeine, in other words, having caffeine in a state in which you've already eaten a large meal, or if you are insulin resistant and you ingest caffeine with MCT oil and fat. So I want to show what insulin does for the liver so that you may understand this lipotoxicity. As Americans, we eat a large amount of carbs and large amount of fat. If you are insulin sensitive, if insulin is working well, so here is the gut, the fat that is ingested by the gut is packed into a chylomicron, which is nothing but a fat-filled globule. And this chylomicron then circulates, trying to find fat cells to dump its lipid cargo. If your fat cells are healthy, it's able to dump the fat in very easily. And it has a very short time in circulation. This chylomicron can also dump fat into the muscles so that it can be used for oxidation. So in healthy and active people, this chylomicron is used up very easily and you leave with a small number of chylomicron remnants. In other words, a chylomicron that is delipidated, even though it is delipidated, it still has a substantial amount of fat. And here is the role of the liver. The liver picks up these chylomicron remnants and converts them to VLDL. Now the VLDL are again in search of a target. Fat cells to dump its cargo, muscles to dump its cargo so that it can be used for oxidation. The other job of the insulin is to take all the carbs that you have eaten, all the sugar, and to take the sugar and through the action of insulin, convert the sugar to glycogen. So in other words, glycogen synthesis the function of the insulin is to make the liver suck up the carbohydrates that you have eaten so that they're not left in the circulation and convert it into glycogen. Muscle is also doing that. Here I'm focusing on the liver. So to simplify this, from the gut, you've eaten fat, you've eaten glucose or carbs. The function of the insulin is to act on the liver and convert it, suck up peas from the circulation and convert it into glycogen or re-export it out as fat, which is called lipogenesis. The question that arises is what happens in liver insulin resistance, hepatic insulin resistance? In hepatic insulin resistance, the liver is resistant to the action of insulin as far as taking up carbs, as far as taking up glucose. It refuses to take up glucose. It refuses to make glycogen. Not only does it do that, but in the setting in which we as Americans have consumed a large amount of carbs, and there is a large amount of carbs in circulation, the liver is not only refusing to take it up, but it increases hepatic glucose outputs. In other words, the liver is spewing out sugar. You would expect 
that liver should not spew out fat. But unfortunately, like Ben Bickman has recently spoken about at Loka Denver, when the liver is insulin resistant, it actually increases the production of VLDL, fat-filled cholesterol molecules that get dumped into the circulation. So coming back to the ingestion of caffeine, you want to ingest caffeine in a fasted state. You want to mobilize fat so that this fat is used for fat oxidation in the muscles and this fat is used for making ketones. How much of this is happening in this group of young individuals is like this. In this diagram, I have shown that this is the group that had caffeine. This is uh, in the morning in a fasted state. In green is the fat oxidation. In the brown is the recycling of fat. The fat is being taken up by the liver and recycled to be packed back. When you ingest caffeine, there is significant lipolysis. You are releasing a lot of fat into the circulation. But unfortunately, the majority of it is going through non-oxidative fatty acid disposal. So in other words, this is not being used to generate energy. It is being used to be recycled back. That increase is about 130%. It does increase fat oxidation but the increase in fat oxidation is a very small amount, 44% compared to 130%. When you use beta blockers, and this is a, a point that I want to make for healthcare providers and for people who are not losing weight, who are at a weight stall, beta blockers prevent the oxidation of fat that is released as a result of caffeine. They also prevent the non-oxidative fat disposal and perhaps healthcare workers can find alternatives to beta blockers for these individuals. So summarizing, when you look at caffeine, it does mobilize fat quite vigorously. It does increase thermic energy. In other words, it generates heat. Now, a small component of mobilized fat is used for fat oxidation to make ketones and to be used as fuel by the muscles. But a much larger percentage of that is recycling of fat in which if you are insulin resistant, it may get into your viscera into your liver, into your spleen, into your pancreas, into your heart, and may be potentially harmful. So an individual who is insulin resistant and otherwise obese may think twice about consuming large amounts of MCT oil and butter in their coffee because it may not be beneficial. Perhaps it's best to consume caffeine in the fasted state and the question that I'm fascinated about and have a lot of data on that I'm going to talk next week on, so I want to leave you with a carrot, is if you combine the ingestion of caffeine and you exercise in a fasted state, does that increase lipid oxidation? In other words, the burning of fat dramatically. Does that increase the production of ketones dramatically? So here is my last slide in which I'm again giving you an incentive to come back and listen to the next edition in which I'm going to discuss the effects of caffeine and fasting and exercise in terms of fat burning and ketone body production. Thank you.